Yes, the recording has started. So good evening to all of you. I welcome with hearty greetings for the day uh, that is Monday, the fourth uh, day of this symposium, which is conducted on the theme, the changing concept of uh, liability and its variables, its different forms, elements that is in contemporary situation has gone into a paradigm shift and continuously uh, growing with the uh, different perspective as according to behavioral economics and uh, social uh, circumstances. So concurrently, it has been uh, uh, an idea that has been taken up in this uh, symposium to put it into forum so that many of the international, national or local speakers uh, viewpoint can be gathered and for later on further, it can be into an operative analytical study that uh, what kind of uh, recommendations have come out of this uh, discourse. And secondly, I would also like to introduce my institution in one line. My institution is known as Bhopal Nobles University. It is conducting this symposium in a celebration of the centenary year uh, of Bhopal Nobles Sansthan, which sponsors Bhopal Nobles University because Bhopal Nobles University has its only the period of six years in existence, but it has been uh, into, uh, 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 you know, may say, conglomeration of many educational units uh, earlier since 1954 uh, in higher education, but in 1923, it has its foundation uh, through a trust and later on Bhopal Nobles and Sun started sponsoring all the educational units. So it's hundred years has been over so this is a centenary year of its establishment. And coincidentally, uh, we have got some in collaboration and integration, a bilateral uh, exchange of uh, educational network and academic uh, research review with the Gaius Institute. Uh, Gaius is a Roman jurist who had been existing in the common era of uh, 110 to 180 AD. Uh, and the, this Roman jurist has been so well and been uh, canonically uh, uh, recognized all across the world, especially with regard to the study of European law. And uh, the you know, Professor Salvatore Azariti, who has been into coordination with, this, uh, uh, with us, uh, has been the co-host on behalf of his own institute, which is called as International Institute for advanced legal uh, sciences. So the, both the institutions are integratedly uh, working on some new kind of uh, uh, integrated project. And that's why we have uh, uh, thought to hold a symposium for seven days together from all across India, learned colleagues, uh, lawyers, judges, magistrates, uh, alumni of uh, law schools, etc. So here we ha have on our screen, uh, you know, the very much supportive figure, uh, I would say uh, without his blessing, my this day could not have continued. And it is uh, mm, uh, a matter of privilege and honor to welcome him. Uh, and the fellow uh, is Dr. Chandra Prakash Gupta from Apex University, Jaipur. And uh, I, I welcome you, sir. Good evening to you. On behalf of my host university, Bhopal Nobles University, and from the co-host, uh, our partner, uh, Professor Salvatore uh, Azariti, who uh, is into a kind of an uh, idea of bringing up a new uh, institute, International Institute for Advanced Legal Sciences. So he's a co-host. I welcome you all and all my attendees. I'm thankful that you are coming slowly and gradually to join in this discourse. Uh, now I welcome uh, my uh, first speaker, honorable speaker, uh, Professor Alok Yadav uh, from uh, University of Lucknow, uh, located in Lucknow uh, of Uttar Pradesh. And he has his expertise, of course, in all uh, the areas of uh, the study of law belonging to TOT. And it's been a pleasure to meet him on screen in hybrid mode. Mm -hmm educate all learners whether they are absent right now or whether they will be then listening later on with all inquisitiveness to understand his all lesson that he would deliver to us today so, uh, i invite uh, humbly our first speaker professor 
आलोक यादव थैंक यू मैम फॉर योर सच नाइस इंट्रोडक्शन ए वेरी गुड इवनिंग टू ऑल ऑफ यू रिस्पेक्टेड होस्ट एंड को होस्ट रिस्पेक्टेड ऑर्गेनाइजर्स एंड रिस्पेक्टेड डीन डॉक्टर सी पी गुप्ता सर it's a matter of honor for me to be the part of this symposium today uh, i will uh, my focus today is on uh, 30th liability of state first uh, i will say a few words about uh, tort law as uh, we will discuss 30th liability of state so uh, first we should uh, Uh, some words about tort then talk about the uh, of course tortious liability in detail tortious liability of state tort law has been defined as a civil action other than a contract action in which uh, a damage uh, remedy namely money is sought it includes uh, intentional tort uh, negligence strict liability and specific categories like a medical malpractice and defamation what do we mean by saying that torts are civil action is that they are lawsuits brought by an individual or any corporation against uh, another individual or corporation rather than a uh, criminal action which would be uh, brought by the government prosecuting an individual for a crime tort law is mostly state rather than uh, we co- uh, can say federal it includes some statutes and it also includes uh, court decision made by judge in the tradition of the common law indian as per indian law is concerned indian law is a practically english law the law of torts as followed by the courts in india is mainly the english law of torts which itself is based on the principle of the common law of england Indian courts are bound to administer the English common law rules only in so far as they are consistent with justice, equity, and good good conscience. It is true that uh, uh, some of the eminent judges of the British Indian High Courts uh, uh, refuse to follow certain English common law. as we know that common law rule of absolute immunity of crown is based on the maxim the king can do no wrong and this maxim has never been applied in india in total even though the basic rights of the citizen of india are protected by the guarantee rights and part third of the constitution the common law principle based on king can do no wrong held to give full protection of human rights arise from the time of the east india company the state has been made liable for the tort of its servants but courts have fixed liability for tort without any difficulty only to those acts uh, committed by the servants of the state in exercise of non sovereign power however uh, in case of acts 
committed in exercise of uh, sovereign uh, powers there is a conflict and great confusion here it is submitted that the courts uh, have erringly confused sovereign powers with the acts of state which thought done by the sovereign is an act against uh, another sovereign or alien outside the national territory and uh, is not an act for which the question of compensation arises here is a question that for what extent the government will be liable for thoughts of its sovereign uh, servants or imply so uh, if we see the um, uh, very maxim think and do no wrong or uh, the king cannot be sued in his own court this from this magazine it is clear that uh, king can do any act the king of england has been uh, said uh, uh, fountain of justice why did so find fountain of justice because all the powers of three organs was vested in king so <coughs> the liability of the state for the tortious action of its servant and agent is governed by the provisions of the constitution of article 300 as per indian uh, concern as per the position of india is concerned but refers back to the government of india act 1935 1915 and 1958 government of india act uh, 1858 says that uh, liability of the state could be like that of liability of east india company so in order to understand the liability of state in tort for the action of uh, its servants and agents it is necessary to find out of the liability of state prior to government of india act 1858 so uh, due to during the reign of east india company in 1831 the supreme court of calcutta was uh, bold enough to reject the plea of uh, exemption from suit raised by company on the ground of sovereign immunity and uh, this can be seen in uh, bank of uh, bengal versus united company but later on in uh, p and o steam navigation companies case the court distinguished the function as sovereign and non sovereign for determining the liability of the state and this uh, sovereign and non sovereign this discussion is made without any rationality but it is still remain alive in the legal system of india as the basis for determining the liability of the state further in kasturi law the court supported the immunity of the state on the ground of uh, uh, sovereign function until now this uh, principle has not been overruled in order to determine whether an uh, act is a sovereign function or not the courts in india have often uh, often resorted to the test laid down by the chief justice peacock in uh, 
P and O is the navigation company versus a uh, secretary of state for India case. And uh, according to uh, Justice Peacock, sovereign power means power which cannot be lawfully exercised except by sovereign or private individuals delegated by a sovereign to exercise them. However, the judiciary has not laid down any clear or unambiguous uh, uh, test for determining what actually these sovereign powers are. Further in uh, uh, Navin Chandar Dev versus Secretary of State uh, uh, and uh, in Secretary of uh, uh, State versus uh, Hari Ban Ji, the interpretation given in these cases, the liability of the state can be determined on the basis of the function of the state as sovereign and non sovereign. So, in uh, in the case of sovereign function, the state could not be liable. But in the case of non-sovereign function, the state could be liable. If, uh, if you see whether there is any legislative uh, efforts uh, has been made, so no legislative enactment is made to overrule this principle of the state of affairs. In uh, uh, most of uh, the cases, the court could not fix the liability of the state on the ground of sovereign immunity because this principle of immunity uh, is not abrogated. So these imperfections continue in different cases. The court repeatedly uh, express the fact that the remedy lies in the hands of the legislature and not in the hands of the judiciary. Uh, therefore, the Law Commission of India recommended as early as uh, uh, 1956 are dispensing with the dis distinction between sovereign and non-sovereign powers. The Law Commission in its report uh, recommend to, uh, recommended to modify uh, the existing law and introduce the bill to amend the law to, uh, to make the state liable like any other ordinary person. It uh, rightly observed in its first report that there is no uh, convincing reason uh, uh, as to why the government should not be placed itself in the same position like uh, that of a private uh, uh, person a uh, private employee subject to same rights and duties imposed by the statute as we know that the uh, vicarious through vicarious liability employer is uh, liable for the work done uh, by his agents in course of employment. In the same way, <coughs> sorry. in the same way here, in case of government, the government introduced a bill entitled the government uh, liability in a tort bill. <coughs> sorry was introduced in the parliament uh, in 1965 but it lacked and it was reintroduced in 1967 again in 1969 by the joint selection committee of parliament but uh, the bill has not been enacted into law so far The government allowed the bill to lapse on the ground that they would bring uh, an element of uh, rigidity 
in the determination of the function of uh, liability of the government in charge. Through the law relating to state liability, charter liability of state in India today deals with the pre-constitutional law in which it is stated that the liability of the state will be like that of liability of East India Company. So the commission suggested the making of suitable law on this point. In England, the Crown Proceeding Act 1947 made the Crown liable for the acts of its servants. So after this act in England, the concept was changed. This party, uh, priority uh, is maintained between the crown and a private individual in respect of liability in the courts. If you see the position of uh, United States of America, then it also the Federal Tort Claims Act 1946 has been created to define the immunity of the state uh, for tortious acts. And uh, similar laws can be seen uh, in UK, USA, and in France. So, under a Republican constitution, particularly in a socialist state, the sovereign immunity should be confined to the bare essential uh, function uh, of the state. In all other cases, the government should be made liable for the wrongful acts of its servant. It is submitted that the legislation should come forward with a legislation, uh, with a legislation clearly defining and uh, demarcating the scope of immunity and liability of the government. The liability should be broad enough to cover all the illegal acts of the government servants and the uh, agents of the uh, state committed in the course of their lawful employment. And it is only by such a rule can justice be rendered to the helpless victim. The weak principle of sovereign immunity has no place in modern society where human and fundamental rights are given transcendental uh, uh, position for uh, instance right to equality, right to free and fair election uh, are part of basic structure doctrine. Liberty and equality are the demands of the modern times. So, with these rights, there are remedies to redress their violation. The uh, eroding principle of uh, uh, sovereign immunity in the light of uh, emergence of constitution, constitutional torts and compensation jurisprudence. Uh, held in a string of Supreme Court cases. And it clearly shows the modern social welfare approach, of course. After all, the principle of sovereign immunity uh, not a feature of uh, uh, an independent socialistic welfare state. The Law Commission stated that in the context of the welfare state, it is necessary to establish a just relation between the rights of the individual and the responsibility of the state. But however, the need, of, need for legislation in the regard of vicarious liability can't be ignored. The Supreme Court in the case of Vidyavati Kasturi Lal, uh, N. Nagendra Rao, Municipal Corporation of Delhi. In all uh, these cases, urge the legislature 
to come up with a law. If you see Article 300, uh, Class 1 of Indian Constitution itself laid down that uh, the government of India may sue or be sued by the name of the union and government of a state. May sue or be sued by the name of the state and may subject to any provision uh, uh, which uh, may be made by act of parliament or uh, of the legislature of such state enacted by virtue of uh, powers confirmed by this constitution. According to uh, present uh, legal system, the aggrieved had to approve the civil court are getting the compensation where the principle of sovereign immunity is the rule. There is no rational in distinguishing the function as sovereign and non-sovereign. There, there are no guidelines to distinguish uh, sovereign function from non-sovereign function. Now, judiciary is following the traditional method to categorize the function. The court also felt difficulty in deciding the case on the basis of the old archaic principle. When uh, uh, the aggrieved approached the court on the uh, uh, infringement of their guarantee right, it is not fair on the part of judiciary to say that it is uh, helpless to give a remedy. And it is still haunted by the old doctrine. So the test of sovereign and non-sovereign function can't be treated as an appropriate one to decide the liability of the government. Since it lacks objectivity, if uh, a judge uh, is biased in favor of government, he can't, uh, he can hold the uh, uh, activity in question as a sovereign function and exclude liability. If, he, if uh, he wants to help the aggrieved, he can uh, characterize the function as non-sovereign. So in uh, India, there is no uniformity in judicial decision. There is no uniform test to decide whether a particular act is sovereign or non-sovereign. There is no any guideline to distinguish sovereign function. Uh, from non-sovereign function. A close scrutiny of uh, judicial decision discloses the, that uh, the classification between sovereign and non-sovereign function is not based on any clear principle. The court has to decide each case on its own facts. This problem to some extent can be rectified by enacting a comprehensive legislation governing the liability of the state for tax committed by its uh, uh, official. The court repeatedly stated through the decision that the remedy lies in the hand of legislature and that uh, it would amount to denial of justice to the aggrieved. The law being the civilizing machinery of the people, it is necessary to make the law as a predictable working system. So in a modern welfare state, it performs several functions and so there may be chances to encroach on the right of the citizen. When it tends with uh, a case, it is not fair to uh, say that the state must be uh, exempted from liability only on the ground of sovereign immunity. Protection of human rights has got a wide uh, recognition in the present day world of human revolution. The change in administration of a state from less fairy to welfare system and inclusion uh, of the uh, declaration of rights in the constitution of most of the countries after the second world war increased the responsibilities of the state 
in protecting the human rights of the people. But when it comes to enforcing these rights against the state for its violation, the principle and uh, procedure seem to be inadequate. The writ court in India recognized constitutional tag under Article 32 and uh, 226 of the Constitution. When the fundamental rights are violated by the state, the aggrieved party can uh, approach the writ court under Article 32 and 226 of the Constitution by filing writ petition before the Supreme Court and High Court. Now, uh, the judiciary use Article uh, 21 to promote compensatory jurisprudence to enforce right guarantee to the people and begin to grant compensation in case of violation of human rights. And uh, it also clarified in a number of cases that sovereign immunity is not a defense in case of public law and It is observed that the decision of the High Court or Supreme Court acting under Article 2 to 6 or 32 uh, respectively can award compensation in case of uh, uh, violation of fundamental right to life and personal liberty by the police in respect of those who are either under the police custody are in the process of arrest and detention. And then the doctrine of sovereign immunity in such case does not apply for the state to avoid the liability of payment of compensation. So such a liability of the state is in addition to the rights of the victim to claim damages from the state under the civil law, as in the case of Udal so human rights need to be respected, protected, and in case of violation, they are required to be compensated. To uh, reduce violation of human rights, element of humanization must be present everywhere. The literature and uh, judiciary in India have shown deep concern for promotion and protection of human rights. So, considering the aforesaid uh, uh, discussed judicial trends, it can be uh, concluded that the superior courts in India, especially the uh, Supreme Court, in uh, appropriate cases, have reduced the substantive sentence and uh, granted the compensation to the victim. The Supreme Court has also made the state and its uh, agencies liable for violation of human rights and required them to pay compensation to the victim of illegal detention, custodial rape, rape, mass disasters, etc. The courts are committed to protect human rights of victim by granting compensation and creating obligation on their part to consider issue of compensation at trial level only. So it can be concluded that the defense of sovereign immunity is not uh, now not available to the state whenever its employer commit tort against the city. As to the law is now overruled and the apex court has given a new dimension to the state liability principle from legal parties. The concept of paying the compensation has been evolved that whenever there is a violation of fundamental right of life or liberty by any employee of the state, it is vicariously liable for such a uh, act. The remedy for getting damage, uh, damages can be available both through writ or through civil litigation. The uh, administration uh, of the criminal justice system should be in conformity with the rapid change in the society. So, uh, uh, can I uh, continue, man? If uh, time is permitted. Yes, you are. Yeah, you can take five minutes more. 
Okay, okay, thank you. Thank you. So, uh, we can I see that uh, uh, continue re reaction in the law and the implementation mechanism needed. The higher courts in India started giving compensation in a case of violation of human rights. But there is no rationality in fix, fixing the uh, compensation because there is no um, um, legislative framework. Now, the compensation is considered on the facts and the circumstances of each case. And it is determined by taking into account the nature of the crime. So, so it will be better if our parliament enacts a law on this point and makes the state statutory liable. Whenever there is any tort committed by its implied, whether uh, in the exercise of sovereign or non-sovereign function. So uh, that's uh, all about uh, uh, today's lecture. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. So uh, our chair, honorable chair, uh, Dr. Chandrakash Gupta from Apex University, Jaipur, is here on screen. Uh, I just uh, invite Professor Chandra Prakash ji to kindly uh, say some kind of commendable compliments for such hard uh, work and earned knowledge he has. Thanks a lot, ma'am given for this opportunity. According to Professor Alok sir, explain all over the era of vicarious liability, especially defined liability in various aspects, especially Indian contest and Vidyavati versus State of Rajasthan case and judicial activism after the pronouncement of various judgments, explain the vicarious liability all of features. And recently, uh, Professor Alok sir explained the criminal justice system in India, or particularly compensation side, uh, very broadly explained. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Sir, next and uh, speaker, our honorable, very experienced and you know worldwide, uh, been a popular, acclaimed person, Professor Pranjal Kumar Fukan is uh, there on screen. He has been already in, I think, five, six minutes late to deliver his lecture. So I reciprocate. Uh, uh, we uh, feel sorry for delaying the things for five, six minutes. Uh, sir, please do come in and uh, continue with your discourse. So could you just uh, enlarge your screen, Professor Pranjal Kumar? And all, uh, Professor Alok, sir. Is it coming? Yes. Stay, stay here. Don't go away. Today you have to spare your hours to us. Okay, okay. Thank you. Yes, sir. Yeah, you are uh, seen now. Very yeah, good evening, ma'am. Good evening. Uh, good evening, ma'am. Good evening to all esteemed members. Actually, I have been in touch with ma'am for a long time, <laughs> and I think this is the third one. I think third one. Uh, last year, two we had. And she asked me that, told that being an industry professional, basically, I'll be more into the contractual liabilities. Okay. So today I'll be discussing on contractual obligation and liabilities, which mostly uh, industries, professionals, and enterprises faces, all including academic institutions nowadays, because that's the most important part of the, uh, uh, you can say, confidence building exercise as per the law. So can I, ma'am, share my presentation? Sure, sir. Uh, one minute, uh, share screen. Yes, one minute, ma'am. I think my screen is visible to you, ma'am. Yes, sir. So... Uh, I discussed to, uh, to discuss on liabilities and the contract, contractual liability. 
So uh, I have a, I have my, I have a, I'm having also a platform, digital platform called Cosmos Minds, which basically we are working for students, faculties, institutions, academic institutions, industries, and uh, youth for startup. So whatever I am showing, basically I am citing it from two uh, documents. One is legal nature of contractual liability, a comparative study made by Nadia Kuzmar and. Mohammad Ilabiat in in their International Journal for Scientific and Technology, Volume Nine, Issue Three, March 2020, and another one from Up Council, uh, Council dot com, a company from their uh, website uh, uh, that is identification uh, contracts. So continue with this. First of all, like uh, these are the basic things uh, normally. Uh, people know, but they uh, fail to know, like uh, industry professionals or industry bodies, their nitty-gritty about these uh, liabilities. So obviously, any contractual liability, we know that civil liability is divided into contractual. Another is contractual liability or torts, where the former, which is the subject matter of this paper, is established in case of breach of any contractual obligations. While later, which is uh, established in the case of the violation of a legal obligations. So normally, in principle, any contract is made to be implemented, where each party to that contract are entitled to obtain his or her rights in as contained in the contract. If either of the party fails to fulfill his or her contractual obligations, obviously, then he or she is to be legally uh, civilly liable. Where C or he is required to compensate and oblige for all the damages incurred by him or her for non-implementation of any contract for which both have signed to. So, continuing to that, it always refers to the liabilities that one party of a contract soldiers on behalf of another party, which needs to be implemented through an indemnity agreement or it can be also called as harmless agreement. So this type of liabilities with the indemnity agreement is used to transfer the risk of any lawsuits from one party to another. Normally it happens in any industries, also in, nowadays in any academic institutions when implementation commissioning or build on lease or something like that happens during the project phase or for any activities related to uh, modification or changes not only in hard, but in soft, like implementation of any softwares, any new technologies, then the indemnity bond is very much required so that the risk of uh, lawsuits from one party can be transferred to another, making an important concept in risk management. So in this case, basically, when one party agrees to be held liable for the losses or damages which are being made by another party, then he or she is assuming that contractual liability is there. So similar to many other companies, our business or your business may perform work for another company or they can hire another company to perform their work. Whichever the case may be, we all have to sign a contract that includes an indemnity agreement. So in this case, basically, whichever the case, as I said, we have to sign a contract which includes an indemnity agreement, which is also being called as harmless agreement because in this case, when one party promised to bear the liability on behalf of other or person or entity, it has to be recorded in the form of which we call a harmless agreement. So in any indemnity agreement, party A agrees to indemnify or compensate the party B for the losses and damages which are resulting due to party C's lawsuit in the event that party B is sued due to party A's negligence. So a contract of indemnity is establishes a proper method, a legal method for transferring the financial risk to a third party with a written contract. And obviously it lists all the parties who are involved into it, part like party A, B, C, D, whoever are involved into this. The situations that need to be covered and the party or parties who will soldier the risk. So essentially a company which indemnifies another company it always accepts the liability related to a specific product or service. So more common clauses basically are like, we know that we need to have a commercial contracts, legal contracts, loan agreements, supply agreements, 
licensing agreements and leases. In all these cases, we have the indemnity clauses. So for example, for a contractual liability, if I say, suppose a property owner called ABC Properties, he hires a general contractor called XYZ Builders so that they can refurbish their office building. However, XYZ Builders again hires a PQR Electricals to replace the old wiring in the building with some new wiring. XYZ is aware that someone may be injured or, proper or property may get damaged if PQR makes any mistakes during the replacement of the old wirings with new. If that happens, then obviously the injured party may seek compensation by filing a suit against XYZ and PQR. So in order to protect itself against potential lawsuit, now XYZ requires PQR to enter into this contract because PQR may say sometimes that I don't know, I am not being uh, entitled or I am not being said to share this risk as per the contract. So he needs to enter into a contract which includes mostly that indemnity agreement. So in this agreement, basically, it is very clearly stated that it will be stated that PQR will be responsible for any losses whatsoever incurred if someone suffers property damage or bodily injury due to PQR's negligence while performing that stated wiring work. So in other words, the contract requires PQR, PQR to bear the liability for any damages which are being assessed again XYZ because of the lawsuit filed by the person for whose property or, or whose bodily injury or damages happen. So it is also likely that PQR will be responsible for the cost of defending XYZ against the lawsuit. So it, they also include not only compensating the third party, but also be responsible for the cost which has been, which has been basically incurred by XYZ while defending the lawsuit. So as shown in the example which we have discussed regarding that building involving three parties, so a contract can also serve as a tool for transferring the risk. So by using this indemnity agreement in any contract, contracts or contract agreements, so XYZ Builders has basically transferred the risk of lawsuits to PQR, who will be actually doing these activities. So as it will be performing the wiring work, so PQR basically is in a good position or in a better position than XYZ to prevent the losses. And that can be potentially result from that kind of work because now he's liable to take up the soldier the risk. So he'll be more conscious about doing the activities or job because he'll be doing jobs. So, he'll, so PQ will be more knowing, uh, means knowing more than XYZ while performing the activities. So therefore PQR should be the party who assumes the risk of the violated losses because he knows. So that's why he'll be assuming that whatever the potential losses may happen and based on that he will execute or they will execute the work to avoid the any losses happening and finally they have to incur the losses as per the indemnity bond agreement made in the contract. So when liability for losses is transferred from party A to B through an indemnity agreement is basically does not erase party A's liability toward the injured person. It doesn't mean that signing the indemnity agreement party A is free. So agreement does not prevent third party from suing the party A and has no effect on his or her liability towards an injured third party. So all all it does basically is a transfer liability for the financial losses which is resulting from the lawsuit including damages and defense costs to party B. So it means when party A and B has signed an indemnity agreement so party A also has the responsibility and they cannot just say that we have no responsibility now because we have made the indemnity agreement between party B. So many business owners, they are, normally they enter into these contracts because many types of contracts are happening day to day basis that includes an indemnity agreements. So the examples like property leasing happens with the construction agencies, construction activities, then construction agreements are happening uh, for the industries, then equipment leases, lease are being given uh, for, the, for the purpose of construction or like backhoe loaders and all these things, trucks and easements. So the liability obviously you bear under this contract is automatically included in a standard general liability policy. So coverage for any contractual liability is available through an accept, exception to an exclusion under coverage A which normally covers liability for body injury and property damage. So obviously this contract agreement also sounds good in this case basically for the insurance agreements. 
So if you look at the bodily injury and property damage conversions, coverage sections in any of the liability policy of the contract, so you may think that contractual liability is not covered because this happened because coverage A has a contractual liability exclusion normally. So this exclusion obligates the insured to pay damages for the bodily injury and property damage because of the liability assumption is already there in the agreement. So the third party who will be the insurance agency will be paying for that liabilities because in this agreement, the insurance policy also part of the contractual agreement. So the liability policy always provides coverage for bodily injury and property damages that will be liable in, in absence of a contract. So for instance, for example, you have just rented a forklift to move crates outside your warehouse. Supposedly, accidentally it collided with a truck that belongs to your neighbor. So you may have signed a rental agreement that gives you some liability for damage for the forklift or other property. So now coming to what is indemnity? because we have discussed something about the indemnity uh, clauses and indemnity uh, which is being made in their contractual agreements. So it is basically is an individual or business for receiving the compensation for losses and damages. From a legal, legal perspective, if I say it may also refers to gaining some immunity for any liabilities or damages which is happening due to the contractual obligations. So indemnity is basically a contractual agreement in which one party agrees to pay for any damages or losses that are caused to another party. For example, in an insurance contract, as we are making for life insurance, general insurance, fire or peril insurance, or you can say pilferage insurance. So that way, one party agrees to pay the other party. One party with the insurance agency will pay to the uh, insurer for any losses or damages in return for any premium, which, is being, which needs to be paid to the insurer. So now coming to the indemnity clauses, it is basically included in any insurance agreements they are basically being covered. Uh, they specify what is covered, what is not covered, and extent of that coverage. So indemnity agreement will obviously will contain some language about the period of indemnity. It always has a period. It cannot be a lifetime, which is a specific period in which the indemnity will remain valid. And many agreements also include a letter of indemnity, which ensures that obligation of both parties shall be met and guarantees that haven't been achieved will require indemnity payments. So indemnity is frequently used in contracts if it is in between businesses and individuals, businesses and governments, governments and with other countries. So it is useful for setting parameters of any contractual agreements in between around the scope of the contract, time period of the contract, maximum liability uh, of the, uh, as per the contractual agreements and insurance covenants. So in order to simplify, we can say it is a way to transfer the risk from one individual or group to another party. So normally there are three types of clauses. First one basically is called broad form of indemnity. So this type of clauses, the indemnitor responsible for his or her own negligence as well as any negligence from a third party. So this could make liable from the indemnity is negligence. Suppose, for example, in certain states, example, in US, like California, the indemnity cannot transfer damages caused by their own negligence or willful misconduct of the indemnitor to someone. So this is called first type, broad form of indemnity. Second one is basically intermediate form of indemnity. This basically specifies that a party for this negligence, unless they can indemnify a party for its negligence unless they are completely at fault. So this type of indemnity almost always include the phrase. This phrase is always included like caused in part. Since the word whole is not included, it is only for the part of it. It is no longer broad form. It is basically intermediate part or very specific to it. So therefore, the partial negligence of the party in search of indemnity is being covered here. So immediate form is the preferred method in the construction industries because in construction industries, we are not going for the whole part of the contract, but some part of it due to which any damages or any uh, such type of uh, incident happens due to which losses happens to the party A so that it makes the owner harmless for any claims which have been caused by negligence of the owner. Basically, it sets up all or nothing, it means identified, means indemnified. Third part is basically is the comparative form. So here we require 
it requires basically the negligence to be compared who are doing the, due to whose negligence it happens so with this clause the indemnitor will be held responsible for any losses losses caused by their proper actions so common law principles typically which have been recognized in the united states are normally they determine this responsibility the indemnitor isn't liable for negligence directly committed by the indemnity the conditions outlined in the business contract will have to determine how much indemnity one party have to soldier on behalf of the other a proper contract therefore shall indicate the type of indemnity necessary which are based on transaction may it be as we discussed broad form intermediate form or comparative form so the common pitfalls which happens during indemnification uh, as we seen in the contractual agreements are that it is recommended that all party fully understand the indemnity coverage that is provided in the contract and this is the major pitfall uh, basically they don't uh, take care of this much second way to avoid any indemnification related pitfall should include like insufficiently defined or excluded identification procedures you should avoid such thing in the contracts it should be fully defined and it should not never actually exclude any indemnification procedures one minute one minute next uh, ah. so the second one is we should actually avoid failing to success, uh, sufficiently address or overlooking any direct claims it should also avoid including a conflicting limitations of liability agreements and we should also avoid in our contracts basically uh, to, so that we should not fail to include or overlook any individual remedy arrangements so this is the end of my presentations one minute now uh, let me just uh, close this so i am stop sharing my slide now so hope uh, i could have uh, made some uh, clear uh, clarification i mean say clear uh, things to be uh, understood on the contractual obligations including indemnity bonds because that is the part we are uh, daily uh, facing uh, as an industry professional and also i have seen uh, people from the academic institutions also facing nowadays because due to online system all the uh, obligations and contracts also like digital contract agreements are being made we are also making digital contracts we are also making digital indemnity bonds we are doing uh, arbitration digitally so things should be very properly outlined in the contract agreements there should not be any uh, like uh, failing to put it or we should not hide anything because later on during arbitrations or any lawsuits it is really difficult to find out who it, who is due to, due to whose negligence these things happened and uh, both parties are basically suffering so uh, this is my presentation now uh, ma'am tell me like uh, if any questions are there or uh, i think i am speaking to very uh, august body of uh, law makers or uh, people very very expert in their field uh, so obviously these things are not uh, new they may add more to it <laughs> they are they obviously thank you first of all that you have Uh, patiently uh, listen to my uh, presentation thank you sir i leave the platform to the dais to comment <laughs> you are right there are so many learned luminaries of law field are yes, on yes, screen yes. so first our chair is invited uh, uh, i for a minute i'll just uh, inform uh, dr mahavir chaplot are you there mahavir chaplot yeah I'm. I'm very much present. Uh, uh, we'll, we'll take two minutes uh, more to just uh, lecture. Okay, two minutes more. We'll take uh, with uh, with our chair. Yes, chair. Uh, Professor Chandragupta Gupta, could you just intervene? According to uh, according to Panjshir presentation. all over the aspect are clear and very uh, proper presentation in this uh, contractual liability regarding this uh, topic uh, but uh, my question is independent clauses explain again mm -hmm. independent clauses yes 
uh indemnity clauses basically i have just uh, put three uh, clauses there mostly because normally what uh, as an industry professional i i can i can share my personal experience that we normally go with the indemnity bonds at any cost uh, at, without indemnity bonds no contract agreements are basically being made and uh, in all these three clauses basically the last one that comparative one we prefer we, we prefer the comparative one must because why uh, because most of our projects are a long term projects like 2 years 5 years so we cannot wait till the end of the contracts to find out who who has done what fault so at the execution level like execution may be happening in monthly basis also half yearly basis also so at that basis we compare what are the losses uh, incurred before moving to the next milestone so in industry part uh, we always go for not for the broad format but we go for the comparative part this is our uh, practice normally we have we do in the industries maybe it be any type of industry count construction manufacturing uh, services so this is my our my my experience basically i don't know uh, much more from the law part but uh, we are comfortable with it regarding uh, comp- that comparative uh, part of the clauses of indemnification clauses in practical aspect uh, comp- uh, at the point of compensation uh, this yeah. indemnity clause is applicable uh at the point of compensation what actually normally what happens we don't wait for the end of the contracts uh, during execution part only we used to uh, compensate uh, issue, with the issuance of execution certificates okay so we take at that level ha huh, identific- at that level identification indemnification is taken care of it is taken care of and that we need to find out like uh, if anything happens uh, beyond the timeline then whose fault was that and that gets captured as part of the indemnity during payout okay. during payout during payout okay thank you thank you sir thank you next one sir uh, now i invite dr mahavi chaplot he is chartered accountant a very well renowned uh, uh, agency uh, is there uh, in udaipur of his accountancy and auditing and of course uh, he is there today uh, from chartered accountancy but i invited him because he is also the member of some international jurist association so naturally he would be a very good source to throw light uh, with regard to tax direct tax and direct taxes Uh, in relation to indian budget and its impact uh, that is of session 2022 so here we uh, are to listen dr mavi chaplot please join in Hello, sir. Please turn on your mic, sir. Turn on your mic, sir. Yeah. So I am uh, very much thankful, Dr. Jayeshi Singh, to invite me in this August gathering of luminaries of uh, law, and I was enlightened to listen to uh, Dr. Chandra Prakash Ji over the Contract Act, and the uh, questions were so apt. So I was also enriched. Now uh, the topic given to me by uh, Jayeshi Ma'am was Union Budget, though it was a postmortem thing but since the year ending is coming on uh, 31st march so i thought this is uh, well subject now to brush up again over the uh, direct tax and indirect tax amendments uh, in the uh, union budget which are going to be effective as you all know on 1st of april 2022 so uh, this budget uh, i think was uh, uh, to there were two subjects uh, two frameworks of this uh, budget where are honorable finance minister me check honorable uh, finance minister mrs nirmala ji has focused on was digital and technology one sec so uh, india posted a growth of 9.2% of gdp as such everybody is surprised of now uh, we can say this period of economy under the visionary leadership of the able leaders is so called amrit kal what i say 
when we related to the past history so the amendments now i'll come to topic because my time limit is just 20 minutes and the topic is so vast direct and indirect tax both we have to cover so i'll just uh, quickly go through the uh, major amendments what i had apprised a new provision is introduced to allow taxpayers to update the past return so earlier the revised return was uh, limited for uh, an year or so only now they had uh, made an amendment Okay, if you have added in filing some, uh, you had uh, added in some filing some information in the tax return, then the new proviso, uh, new uh, proviso has been introduced that you can update the past return and include omitted income by additional tax payment also. The updated return now can be filed within two years from the end of relevant year. Two years. That is a major amendment given in the direct taxes. Then. corporate surcharge was 12% so uh, the government was on the focus of having a make in india and made in india concept but how industries go when the surcharge was not comparison uh, in comparison very high to the other economies of the world so now what they done is in this uh, direct tax amendment in the finance act new finance act that uh, made corporate surcharge from 12 12% to 7% then there was the alternate minimum tax what we called amt it was reduced to 15% for cooperative societies also earlier cooperatives and corporates these were two different uh, tax regimes but now cooperative sector also have been boosted when they are uh, been given a benefit of alternate minimum tax to be 15% only to bring the parity between central and state government employees this is a very good thing for most of the university people and the government employees there was a gap of state government taxes and uh, of employee contribution to the national pension scheme and the state government employee uh, contribution to the national pension fund scheme now both both have been come in parity and both are 14% earlier it was 10% for state government now it has come to 14% that's a very good amendment that uh, state government employees has uh, said ki we are working in the same institute same thing why the difference is there so that now made the parity now if we come for the uh, differently abled uh, parents the parents who are having a son child which is differently abled now it can get a tax deduction on payment of the annuity or lump sum during the lifetime of parent and guardian once the parent or guardian has attained 60 years so that is a very good amendment for special able child parents <coughs> any surcharge and cess levied on income are not allowed as business expenditure so uh, it is a very well known phenomenon uh, most of the uh, law people know it ki any surcharge and cess these are a part of taxes and taxes are not allowed as uh, business expenditure so this was not clear earlier in the earlier uh, finance uh, bill now that introduced in this budget brought forward losses cannot be set off against undisclosed income detected during any survey or search now it was also an uh, lacuna in the previous uh, income tax act so in this budget they had come up if you are uh, detected with uh, any undisclosed income in any search or seizure then you can't claim uh, expenses out of that now there are many amendments in gst act also withdrawal uh, there is one uh, major amendment in direct tax withdrawal of finance surcharge of 25% or 37% on long term capital gain taxable under section 112 now long term capital gain on listed equity shares unit of an equity oriented fund or a unit or business trust taxable under 112a are liable to maximum surcharge of 15% while the other long term capital gains under section 112 are subjected to enhanced surcharge of 25% or 37% depending on the quantum of gain it is proposed to restrict the surcharge on long term capital gain taxable under 112 at 15% this is a major major amendment and a boom to the uh, private equity uh, and long term capital gains since india has uh, you will see uh, produce the highest number of unicorns so they are through private equity and uh, fund raising and it will help them so 37% uh, percent herculean tax has come down to 15% percent. 
there are many many other amendments under section 115 bab terminal rate rate of commencement of manufacturing or production but uh, i think that will be uh, very much technical i'll go through uh, major gst and custom act uh, amendments to cut short an important amendment to the central goods and service tax act is in section 16 34 भाई लग गए क्या सेक्शन 16 34 37 39 52 द लास्ट डेट टू मेक अमेंडमेंट्स करेक्शंस अपलोड मिस सेल्स इनवॉइसेस और नोट्स और टू क्लेम एनी मिस्ड इनपुट टैक्स क्रेडिट और आईटीसी ऑफ वन फाइनेंशियल ईयर इज नो लॉन्गर ड्यू डेट टू बी फाइल्ड सितंबर नाउ इट इज 30th नवंबर अर्लियर इफ एनी मिसमैच वाज देयर इन एन इन आईटीसी then the last date was september now it is 30th november of the following year so it is a very good uh, uh, gesture of the central government and ngst to give the uh, privilege to the businessman who have aid now they can amend their uh, input tax credit uh, mismatch till november of the following year then section 92 of the cgst act is amended for cancellation of gst and by an officer if a composition taxable person composition there is a fixed uh, tax liability composition taxable person fails to file an annual return for 3 months beyond the due date of 30th april of the following year of the following year his registration can get cancelled likewise for any other of other tax payer other than composition the 6 months consecutive default and return filing is replaced with consecutive tax period default as may be prescribed earlier it was 6 months if you are in default if you are not in composition then you may be uh, your uh, gstn number may be cancelled under ccst act section 83 earlier called furnishing of invert supplies is amended completely to remove references of earlier gstr2 and replace it with gstr2 and gstr 2b with new heading as communication of details of invert supplies and input tax credit the due date to file gstr 5 by non resident taxable person is revised from 20th of next month to 13th of next month so they have reduced the uh, timelines of filing the gstr 5 by 7 days section 42 43 48 pertaining to matching reversal of tax credit have been removed so again these were not relevant sections and these have been removed section 42 i'll repeat 43 and 43a pertaining to matching reversal of tax credits the record collection of rupees 140098 crores was gst revenue in january 22 which was the highest since uh, gst inception and in march also i think it is a record so nowadays we have moved from unorganized economy to organized economy and gst collection is a very good sign of that concessional concession custom duty on import of capital good to be phased out the initial rate of 75% is to be imposed then in the phased out manner they will uh, curtail the uh, concessional custom duty on imports to discourage the imports more than 350 exemptions on importing some agri products chemical drug and uh, some more industry etc will be phased out so this is again a uh, boon to make in india concept if uh, concession uh, more than 350 exemptions are given so that uh, we are well versed in the uh, manufacturing sector and they are given a uh, given a huge boost to the agriculture product and chemical industries duty concession on import of phone chargers transformers it is used by everybody so now uh, to enable the uh, domestic manufacturing and per se india is the highest manufacturer of uh, rather i can say assembler of the mobile phones in the world as of now so duty on specified leather packaging boxes reduced to incentive sports custom duty on cut and polish diamonds since to be reduced to 5% so it is again a very good uh, benefit given to the uh, diamond and manufacturers and gems since we are from rajasthan jaipur is very well known for gems industry so it is a boon to specific rajasthan and odipur industry further it is uh, If you'll see the uh, budget allocation, a uh, 6.4% fiscal deficit has been projected due to the COVID times and everything. Government has uh, 
just figured out a 6.4 per percent of 6.4 percent of the fiscal deficit in the uh, budget of financial year 23. Revised fiscal deficit now I think is 6.9 percent. Though initially government has projected uh, 6.4 percent. State to get 1 lakh crores of 50 year interest free loans to help fund of PM Gati Shakti related investment. So PM Gati Shakti is a very uh, noble uh, cause introduced and they have uh, given a setup of 1 lakh crores in this. The government effective capital expenditure is around at 10.6 lakh 8 crore in 2022-23. So it will government expenditure would be around uh, Capital expenditure would be around 4.1% of the uh, GDP, you may estimate it. Then, uh, since we are uh, now being university and everything is on education, so I'll, I'll, I'll prefer to uh, match some points for education. 2 lakh Anganwadi is to be upgraded for improving ch child health. So, Anganwadi is a very crucial uh, part of education system of India when most of the population in the child childhood are going to Anganwadi's. So, 2 lakh Anganwadi's are being uh, upgraded. Two year of education regression for school going children means we need to develop efforts and spending to bridge up education gaps due to COVID. Now, NEP has advocated a 6% of GDP to be directed towards education. So, it's the, I think, uh, first time in the history, 6% of the, uh, if you will see the quantum wise, it is the highest allocation for education ever. While we remain far short, the announcement of tech-based platform, one class, one TV channel program of PM e Vidya for school children and establishment of digital university. Again, now the universities, uh, government has started thinking of digital university and your conference is a uh, example for that. You had already initiated it. So, uh, it was the need of our and you had done it aptly and government is also now thinking for creating digital universities. Now, digital university, how they'll set up, they specifically mentioned digital university to be set up for online education, focusing on ICT using a hub and a spoke model. Then selected ITIs, the technical institutes in all states that will offer skill courses. So they had allocated a budget to that also. One class, one TV ch channel program will be expanded from 12 to 200 TV channels. This will enable all state to provide supplementary education in regional languages from class 1 to 12. So that is a government initiative. Now in regional, uh, you are in Tamil Nadu, you are in Punjab, you are in Kashmir, you have all different languages which students understand. So government is creating a channel for them and 200 channels, regional uh, TV channels will be there for education. Startup is again a very, uh, since you represent the uh, youth in the universities, then startup, everybody in India is, uh, is seeing the unicorn growth and everybody wants to have an uh, own startup. Then defense R&D to be open for industry and uh, in defense, their government has allowed startups now for R&D research base and everything. The startups will be promoted to facilitate drone shakti. Drones have been given a very uh, special weightage in the uh, this budget. Then the government took measures to make MSME more uh, resilient and competitive. There are many much uh, incentives given for MSME and the state government also is providing 5% interest loan subsidy if you do a startup. So that's a very good, uh, up to 10 crores, 5% state subsidy is also available in the interest. So the student who want to become entrepreneurs, it's a very good time to uh, rely on the governments, both state and central government and uh, do employment generation and be an entrepreneur. Then digital banking, everybody now is using mobile banking, uh, internet banking. So. An online bill system will be launched to reduce the delay in payment. All central ministries will use it. Now the government payments will also use the digital banking system. So when we go to government, they give a check and the Babu gives takes a sign and uh, give it to the uh, uh, concern department. It takes five, seven days. So now it will be uh, the government will also uh, release its funds to di digital uh, portal. Credit growth increased by 5. 4 lakh crore this year, the highest in many years. So everybody is taking, nobody is taking loans and all that, but uh, this year the highest growth in the credit has been noted out. 
internet connectivity is is uh, now the government is going on digital universities digital everything is going on digital, even the cryptocurrencies uh, are being taxed in this budget then internet connectivity was an issue because uh, you can you can't see the photographs at a time of uh, everybody who is joining the conference because there is some some issue in internet so that uh, mentioned a special portfolio of investment in this and i think bharat net project contract for optical fiber networks will be handed out under the ppp model so the very fast digital infrastructure will move around there are many n number of uh, other sectors also housing and basic amenity then uh, the scope of pm gati shakti the master plans and everything i, I don't think so those need to be updated in detail then employment is the uh, major uh, issue addressed in this so they had proposed 60 lakh new jobs and additional production of 30 lakh crore during the next key cap digit 5 years so it is production linked incentive scheme what i was talking of uh, pli schemes where the interest subsidy is being given if you start up a capex capex project or a startup or anything in uh, any state government is there to support and they have uh, given the production link incentive so that the uh, interest burden on the manufacturers will low down then pli schemes account across 14 sectors have achieved a tremendous response and created 60 lakh job opportunities so far so pli is again a very much uh, important uh, sector in this budget so i'll uh, sum up the uh, i think i'd covered most of the uh, major pro- uh, since most of you are not chartered accountants you are my clients so it's uh, going into detail section is not the uh, focus of mine for this conference so i i end up with this if anybody has any question on the budget i am ready to serve them even the passports now i'll i'll i had forgot to mention one very important thing is healthcare and passport so in issuance of e passport with futuristic tag to be introduced in 2023 so if you guys travel to many countries now e passports will be a very very much uh, convenient factor for us and it will uh, end up the queues also in uh, long queues in the airport so this is again where uh, india is going to create a history in the world there will be a chip based passport i think so now then healthcare uh, pandemic has brought to the for the issue of mental health the national tele mental health program is also launched since people have uh, there are some pros and cons of everything so this digital economy <coughs> digital i think university concept or webinars everybody is at home so many of us have mental issues also now so government has created a mental health uh, tele mental health program uh, soon and this year you will see it so that the stress level and the guidance will be given on telephone only so i'll uh, end up and i'm thankful to the bn university and the other organizers for this uh, uh, enriching and enlightening program it was very thought provoking when while reading the subjects and my special thanks to uh, dr jayshree singh Ma'am, I can't listen you. Ma'am, you are not audible. Doctor Jayeshi Singh, you are not audible. Yes. Um, a very short question to you, Doctor Mavi. Uh, yeah. Like uh, so many schemes, plans uh, that have been uh, laid out before uh, Indian citizens. Yes. Uh, how how the uh, income. would fall in with the you know with the balancing deficit and inflation here because uh, uh, of course you have said that there are a lot of credits has been seen uh, been issued to all kinds of startups but yeah. how come your agencies as a chartered accountant in agencies how they are going to view all these uh, things in a way like uh, are they really creating any kind of value or is just a dream i'll i'll, I'll uh, it's a very good question and it's a thought provoking thing so i'll take it on me because i am a chartered accountant and since the defense sector as i spoken about has been given a uh, 
um, it's an eyeball to the uh, non finance ministry i think so they had started uh, promoting the defense startup so on my merry own i had uh, i had been a co founder of a startup where i had started the teleoptics manufacturing with a technology man so being a chartered accountant i have got the opportunity to invest in a startup where defense technology is there and my website is there www.systemsforever.com so uh, as of uh, i think it's the bestest period i had ever ever uh, uh, thought of in my life with the support of government so the uh, yeah. middle class and the young youngsters and everybody is now thinking to pitch their idea and government is really ready to mm-hmm. support them and that number is visible by the number of unicorns if you just google it don't go on my words you just google how many unicorns are there in the world and how many uh, unicorns india has produced so more than 100 unicorns mm-hmm. have been uh, given by india in this period secondly you are very right as a ca what what our agency can do what our uh, mother institution can do so what we do is we do just legitimate tax planning we never say our client to uh, evade taxes we can plan their taxes so chartered accountants are the torch bearers and uh, collectors of taxes we are helping uh, we are a part of government uh, only we say they are also irs uh, the uh, gst and the direct taxes department income tax what we in common parlance so uh, say are both are revenue collecting agencies and chartered accountants are helping the revenue collection of the government on only so uh, i think more or less uh, 99% the ICI the Institute of Chartered Accountants of India is helping the government out and uh, these are visible without chartered accountant this much of tax collection wouldn't have been uh, reached so you can see the numbers of gst and direct taxes this is highest ever highest ever so even so, the lawyers judges and advocates yes they yes. are the best you know into Definitely. your uh, definitely they have a very good rapport they have to maintain a rapport with cas <laughs> that that too <laughs> they can't you see basically <laughs> ca uh, always implying something you know in the, to the back of their mind that see you have to come back to uh, in any case in some sort either to the government or to ca buyers and the judges create law they are the part of the and we are the part of law enforcement yeah so everybody has this i think as a as a uh, citizen of india we should everybody should pay uh, genuine taxes and that is the how uh, india will grow if will be true that our, our uh, country will definitely grow that is yes. my thought yeah right. professor chandragupt uh, chand prakash gupta sir are you there yes yes ma'am please do come in and say something to him <laughs> uh, have a query if you have Sir, uh, according to uh, according to dear mahavir ji explain all over the uh, era of uh, recent budget but uh, one my question yes, government is, is working as a commercial purpose or not recent maximum uh, money is growing through tax gst or cgst sgst and other taxes uh, why you are not abolish income tax act and other act why you are not able to abolish 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 okay. to income tax act and other act maximum ah. revenue is 28% gst okay very 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 thought provoking question and i think uh, sir like an entrepreneur even a household or even as a professor as a doctor or or being a manufacturer everybody makes it balance sheet so they have a liability side they have an asset side there were uh, a payment side there were receipt side so you think upon government as a industry just just for a uh, reference now they have also the liability they have their uh, uh, liability of infrastructure they want to create a happiness cushion they want to invest the happiness cushion for us so they 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 go for highways they go for dams they give uh, low cost water supplies they give continuous electricity supplies so every infrastructure and the salaries of the uh, government employees and the infrastructure related thing now if uh, very good question many many people as in uh, when i was a ca student i also used to think why income tax is there it should be a banking uh, tax and it should be abolished but when i uh, studied it deeply 
the balance sheet has to be in equilibrium it has to be balanced so if we'll abolish the uh, income tax act there will be a new tax on you suppose there will be a tax on banking transaction because government needs those 15 lakh crores which have been collected by direct tax if will not uh, they will not earn through uh, income tax they'll impose some other tax there is no other uh, revenue model to the government so either of it is just the changing of name and uh, we won't be at ease because uh, to run the country to run to get the uh, Uh, growth and the infrastructure they need money so uh, how does it matter they are charging from income tax or they are charging through gst or they'll uh, charge some highway tax or they'll charge some uh, parking tax so either some or way they have to collect taxes so this is my uh, thought that they are right uh, they are not abolishing the income tax act because it will turn to some other form of tax which again will be an unease to the uh, people <laughs> now it is very much uh, mm. even because we are not in the capitalist economy a uh, total capitalist economy what we already said so those who are earning are paying taxes so that's that's a great because uh, we are under that regime where we are able to contribute to the country so that's the uh, best side of the story we are not takers we are givers so that way income tax payer are always at an ease ki why we are paying for the other but those are also our countrymen everybody has a right to live so we are contributors and uh, i think you should uh, always be feel happy if we are not take we are givers yeah okay thanks thank you i would like to request to all the speakers who have uh, already finished with their talks see we have been so patiently listening and uh, giving all our you know ear to you so i request that you also attend to the last lecture by our co-host because he would like to give you a picture of how he has come into this kind of uh, uh, collaboration and and secondly he has his own topic every day to cover up uh, because oh, wow. he's uh, preparing some kind of you know institute uh, for advanced legal sciences so he has his own mission uh although he has collaborated so in a way he has been a mentor to go for digital university otherwise today only i was uh, told in somewhere uh, uh, telephonically that i should stop all this uh, but i requested that all the official letters has been into uh, kind of a permission to go ahead with all sort of these things and professor uh, salvatore is uh, you know backbone right now who is uh, giving me a torch to please go ahead so that uh, the some of the faculty or some of the dif- disciplines if uh, imitating uh, this process they would also go through uh, digital work so i invite professor salvatore if you are there please come in good evening good evening by your side and good morning so we can see you <laughs> so we can see you Uh, okay okay thanks so much thanks so much to the professor and thanks so much to all the dear colleagues that are attending i'm very grateful once again to your organization and uh also for the the, the very deepening and stimulating team that we are discussing today and that i find very appropriate to resume it in the concept of uh, the breach of duty okay because um this allow us in uh, the perspective of the advancement of legal sciences to have a, a more deeper a more deeper um, analysis after um, more than 20 years of the most important reform that has been conceived in european civil law and that uh, purposefully uh, recognized that the breach of a duty as an, an unitary concept inside and between the two great area by which we normally divide between many others but we could define this as a uh, bay areas but uh, between law of torts and law of uh, concerning the breach of a contract and I'm, of course referring to the modernization of the law of obligation in germany or so called the shoulder ex modernisierung Uh, before entering in my in my talk with you 
I wish to to apologize because I have the this habit. Uh, I perpetuate, I can say, this habit of not preparing my report in writing, uh, which may take it less orderly, but hopefully, I, I hope that it's uh, more lively with uh, regard to your interest. And uh, uh, to enter this, uh, this system uh, concerning the breach of duty, and then to what is, uh, according to my opinion, the most the most important area deriving from this uh, more general system that are the consequential damages in uh, the civil law. Uh, I wish to introduce, first of all, the, the normative system about which we are going to discuss. Uh, after the modernizierung of a uh, uh, German uh, civil code, the BGB, we have a uh, the uh, uh, the most important uh, paragraph introducing the system is the paragraph 280 compensation for violation of a duty and uh, it reports that if the debtor violates a duty arising from an obligation relationship the creditor can demand compensation for the harm arising from these this does not apply if the debtor is not responsible for the violation of duty. We can immediately focus two elements that we are discussing of a pathological, uh, of a pathological evolution of what was at the beginning an obligation. The obligation may derive, okay, uh, as we know, by all the sources of obligation belonging um, systematically to the and uh, without any relevant modification to the mm, civil law in Roman law system. So we have a, for, as a source of obligation, the tort, we have the source of obligation in a contract. So we are discussing in this, in this paragraph about a non-performance of a, of a contract and what are we call it the varie causarum figuris, they may seem many other sources of obligation. Let's say my my great master was uh, very well uh, engaged in uh, unjust uh, unjust enrichment. That is another source. So we have this uh, this dog that is the the paragraph two hundred eighty uh, uh, first uh, first alinea that uh, focus this general this general principle of a compensation whatever the obligation whatever the source of obligation. Then we have uh, then we have uh, two uh, norms that, we, that can be uh, uh, that address us to uh, different areas of subsystem. The second that says that the creditor can only demand compensation for delay in performance under the additional prerequisite uh, of paragraph two hundred eighty six. Then say that at uh, alinea number three, that the creditor can only demand compensation instead of performance under the additional prerequisite of paragraph 281, 282, or 283. Uh, let's go to the, to the um, compensation for delay in performance. And we say that, uh, Paragraph 286, to which the, the, the previous paragraph remained, say that if the debtor does not perform in response to the creditor's warning, which takes place after performance has become due, then he will be in delay as a result of the warning. The rising of a claim to performance as well as the submission of a warning order in warning proceedings are equivalent to a warning. A warning is not needed if a time is determined, if an event must proceed, and many, many, uh, four in total, the elements by which a, a warning is not needed, but the performance is in itself uh, uh, asked, and immediately, if not performed, if not performed, the debtor is uh, in delay, in the condition of a delay. Uh, the debtor, the, the, the closing of the norm, um, the debtor in respect of a demand for payment will be in delay at the latest if he does not perform within 30 days after the due date and uh, an account or an equivalent payment statement is received. I wish to overclose this norm and to go 
directly to the section 281 or better, uh, just to earn time, because I suppose that it, it can be very uh, expensive in matter of time, and I have not, I suppose, to uh, to go directly to the to the main question that I wish to focus today inside this system. I will eventually touch the the referential norms in the case that are needed in the course of the exposition. Uh, it is a very important norm to, to remind that the section uh, 284 talks about the reimbursement of future expenses. And uh, the, the norms, is what in Goma is uh, synthesized as a first year of a vendor. In the place of damages in lieu of, in lieu of performance, the obligé might demand reimbursement of the expenses which he has made and in all fairness was entitled to make in reliance on receiving performance. Unless the purpose of the expenses would not have been achieved even, even if the obliger uh, has not breached his duty. Uh, why uh, all the mm, mm, analysts found very important uh, this norm inside of the civil uh, code and of course inside the discussion concerning the civil system uh, today in matter of, a, uh, of a reimbursement of a full child expenses uh, you know that the, uh, the modern system is, is a not only a system in which we uh, we can have a bilateral a bilateral perspective of the uh, legal and economic activity. But in some forms, everybody is inserted in a chain of exchanging of performance. So if I not, do not re uh, receive the performance from my debtor, I cannot perform by my side. I, if I cannot, if I cannot uh, feel I can't receive the, the, the soil from my, the performer who has the, from the factory who has to, to give it to me, to ship it to me, I cannot uh, perform myself, my, and uh, I cannot, I'm an adapter that has not complied with this obligation to, uh, to, to ship the shirt. So in this kind of, uh, in this kind of a relationship, capitalism, the, it is very important to understand the two things. Every performance is inside of this chain. The second, on the other side, where every non-performance has to be stopped until the point in which remoteness in the effects of non-performance can be stopped. Because otherwise we would construct upon the chain a very large, uh, continuously, repeatedly, uh, activity of non-performance, and we can derive, you know, something that is uh, not justifiable according to our system. So we can divide uh, at first the um, what is uh, um, uh, inside con um, content of these norms. First of all, two elements that can justify the activity of uh, issuing for uh, the paragraph 284. The first one is, uh, of, is uh, surely the so-called expectation interest or uh, Erfüllungsinteresse in uh, German. Uh, is a, this is a general rule that is expected and uh, uh, that is protected by paragraph 281. Uh, and the, the right to claim damages instead of performance. Uh, the rationale of this provision is to, afford, of course, to afford the priority to enforce the performance. Uh, in the case of non-performance, we, uh, we must justify in the uh, per se and in the quantity the expectation interest that has been frustrated. Uh, mm, uh, mm, the profile by which normally the approach is made by the interpreter is that the expectation interest is the interest in being able to put the subject matter of the contract to a certain use. Uh, uh, um, uh, 
For example, a temporary halt in production caused by the failure to deliver a piece of machinery may give rise to liability if the promiser has been put on notice, moratory damages, or so-called Feldzug. Uh, uh, however, uh, well, uh, the, this halt in production is due to the non-conformity of the delivery goods, uh, liability does not depend on whether the promisor has, made, uh, has been put on notice, uh, because of, of, there is another kind of requirement that is the machnun, and this uh, um, and this is another kind of uh, this is not another kind of a problem, but all converging to the same position with the respect to consequential damages. What does mean? That I have the interest not only in the uh, uh, performance of my debtor confirming to my to, to his uh, position, but also to a quality of a performance that is uh, according to his position. And it is not better of a bilateral relationship, but as I told you before, for the same reasons, is a matter of a chain of a, a very much more complex system in which the non-performance or the machnung in the sense of the non-performance in conformity is made me uh, as a creditor with respect to my creditors. Uh, so if we want to synthesize this, we, we, say, we will say that uh, this position uh, protected by the expectation interest is uh, in the sense of the of the of the damages and so in the sense of the the payment and due of performance uh, is made to um, is normally calculated in the sense of uh, with the formula of uh, putting the creditor in the same position as if it was uh, uh, if the performance has been has been made by the debt Beside this interest, there is a, the so-called negative interest, uh, or uh, the interest in the integrity, so-called integritas interesse, uh, in the sense that a performance that uh, no, it is not conformed uh, may cause loss to the promise over and above the loss of the value of the performance, or the loss of the use he intends to make of it. Uh, uh, for instance, uh, the defective goods may explode and cause injury to the promisor. The contractor may do a bad job of repairing a roof, after which rain leaks through the roof and causes considerable damage to furniture and carpets and the upper floor. These are examples they are taking from uh, uh, jurisprudence, <laughs> chiefly because uh, they are uh, at that at the moment of the formation, jurisprudence is of course the most creative and the most, uh, you know, didactic, uh, the lecturing <laughs> interpreters to the rest of the common of the community of interpreters. Um, uh, uh, we have started with so uh, uh, this. I I believe that uh, these elements, of course, if I'm, I was not clear, please ask. Um, further explanation but can bring us to the to the main argument I wish to 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 face today and it is the, um, given by uh, the um, the reliance if we can uh, if we can say these uh, in the um, we sure we can call it a reliance in the civil law even if uh, this was like you know uh, something like uh, a blasphemy until uh, <laughs> the reformation of a uh, civil code, because uh, uh, we were uh, normally the reflection upon the difference of common law and civil law in this area was uh, that this is a, an institute that was very far from the civil law system or from continental system with respect, for example, to English private law. Uh, uh, the paragraph 284 provides, uh, as I told you before, uh, um, an alternative basis for of recovery the promisee. Instead of claiming damages uh, 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 as a substitute for performance, the promisee may recover any expenses made in reliance on the obligation of performance that are frustrated as a result 
of a failure of performance. Uh, the common example is uh, the, the, the shipment of the soil that has been failed. I was uh, all, not only respecting the soil and the producer and the factor who's going to produce the shirt, but I built new machineries and I built the trucks in order to favor my shipments toward the final consumers. All these expenses are frustrated by the non-performance of the debtor who had to, to ship to me the soil in time, or who shipped some uh, soil that is uh, characterized by Machnung, that is a, a quality that is uh, not conforming to the, not compliant to what was expected in order to render my uh, consequential performance and to be frustrated also. So this is the general example in which we apply this kind of a norm. What are the, what is the exit for this kind of uh, uh, expenditures that I made uh, in, in reliance of the um, performance of my debt? Uh, as I told you before, English law is a, uh, uh, no, uh, while we know that uh, reliance has a clear uh, BERT and a clear analysis, doctrinal analysis, we can say that as a, a more than a century in uh, uh, Fuller and Perdue analysis, since the Fuller and Perdue analysis in the United States, uh, uh, English law is a, at the same time no far from the possibility that such expenditure may form the loss to be compensated uh, in the case of a breach of a contract. Um, uh, in our case, we must say that this is not a matter of breach of contract or not directly case of a breach of a contract. Because let's say that the first uh, debtor of the chain may incur in non-performance for many other reasons that are only as a consequence of breach of a contract. But in any case, I must be reimbursed for the footy lie expenses that I incurred in. And this is uh, the question. Uh, oh, well, this is one of the questions. Uh, 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 the analogy with the paragraph 284, uh, it has a uh, it is, has been advanced by great masters in Oxford, in Oxford teaching. That was like, for example, the uh, belated professor Traitel. Uh, uh, is provided by these situations uh, relating to expenditure that had to be made if the promise was to fulfill uh, uh, inside of the of the bargain. Um, this expenditure, of course, becomes uh, uh, wasted where the other party does not perform. And uh, we have a, a very ancient case in, uh, in in English jurisdiction, like the we have a Robinson versus Harman and uh, Lloyd versus Stanbury. Uh, English law extends this conception of wasted expenditure, uh, but to a wider notion of the reliance interest. Here we have a very very more strict and special cases. Um, a, a very more strict and special cases. And uh, uh, we must, first of all, to define what, how, what is, how far can go the, the impact, because we, after 20 years, we do not know yet uh, the impact of paragraph 284 in the, um, in the civil law systems in Europe, at least. But I believe that the kind of principles that can be derived can be extended and uh, uh, can be exported. We, we can so to a very, a very interesting uh, um, area that is, uh, uh, you know, an area that we see as a part of the current, of the current uh, critical area in, uh, uh, for the reasons I told before in the context of the market economy uh, to uh, a, a wider area all over the world. Uh, first of all, I wish to, so I wish to, to, uh, to, to go to the end of my short recapitulation of these issues uh, through, uh, through, uh, uh, two simple, uh, two simple uh, section of these, uh, two simple section of these, um, of, um, of the institution of uh, the 
so call it uh, let's say uh, reliance interest in uh, uh, civil uh, code today the first one is uh, if we uh, if we must or not uh, discriminate and distinguish reliance by expectation uh, so the nature of this right to recover for wasted expenditure uh, 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 has to be defined in this sense uh, mm, uh, at first sight of course it remains uh, the right of to claim for the reliance interest of the common law. Uh, this is uh, what extensively, in the moment in which, to the, the, of course, the, the working operation upon the modernization of uh, uh, German civil law was very well known. Many uh, great juries participated to it, to them. So we have not the problem of a surprise, a final surprise when this norm uh, appeared. Uh, in, 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 as happens uh, in many and many other systems, uh, uh, all these issues derive from jurisprudence and doctrine before the, the works for the preparation of the, the renovation of the modernization started. So there was not a surprise. Of course, it was a, it was a, uh, the, the, the first reflection was a, of a, to see it in the context of a systematic, of a systematic approach, and uh, um, so at the prima facie analysis, it is as, of course the reception of a reliance in common law, the reliance interest. Um, as we know, Fuller and Perdue uh, uh, defined this reliance interest in a very, very well known uh, notion that. Uh, um, the buyer and the contract for the sale of land has incurred expense in the investigations of the seller's title, has neglected the opportunity to enter other contracts. Uh, we may award the damages to the plaintiff for purpose of undoing the harm which his reliance on the defender's promises has caused him. Uh, uh, with the final formula, very well known, they just, I just repeated, our object is to put him in as good a position as if he was in before the promise was made. But uh, a number of other qualifications, as uh, has been said, has been very well explained, that has to be done in order to, uh, to give a systematization of the, the, of the paragraph 284 as a reliance basset. Reliance damages normally uh, seek to put the aggrieved party in the position in which he would have been if the promise has been performed, okay? Or in the case, if uh, had there been no contract. Uh, according to paragraph 284 of the uh, German Civil Code, the change of position of the creditor must be due to his reliance on receiving performance. And the provision covers only that expenditure made in order to be able to use the performance. I wish to be short upon this, uh, uh, this issue. I myself, as expressed in many congresses, at, um, also in Germany or in German speaking, uh, colleagues and uh, uh, considering this, I don't see the contrast. I simply consider the evolution because we can discuss of a, of a contrast in the case that the element, according to a formal legal logic, we can discuss a contrast if the, the, different, uh, the differentiating element is something that cannot insert it and that cannot be justified by the operational form. The operational form of a norm is uh, normally the context in which the norm is issued and in which, and in which the norm is applied. So I don't see the contrast if we, if we, we um, consider that the paragraph 284 is inserted in the current word and so it covers uh, something that happens today in a form in which the patrimoniality of obligation has another kind of a link another kind of a nexus with the context in which this kind of performance must be considered with the respect to the Fuller and Petit time. If we consider that today is a different uh, modern 
the, con the contextual moment in which capitalism apply and in which any performance is, a, as I told you many times today, is part of a chain of a performance, we can see that this kind of a provision can see as an evolution of the previous one uh, famously uh, created or, or in generated by the the um, the Fuller and Perdue doctrine in the United States. Um, a buyer acquires a frame from a third party, especially to fit a purchased painting, but the painting is never delivered. The cost of the frame was incurred in relying on the performance. The damages sought are explicable on the basis of uh, protecting the reliance interest. Uh, had there been no contract, the aggrieved party would likewise not have changed position and ordered the frame. This is very important. We can have a ground for this kind of justification, to which I stopped the first section of this, uh, of this um, conceptual analysis. We can have this kind of uh, uh, justification not only on, on the basis of, but because of. We, we must find uh, some form of a functionality that is a concrete functionality. It is no more the abstract functionality that we have seen uh, just a few minutes ago in reading Fuller and Perdue. Uh, when normally it has been said that uh, uh, neglected the opportunity to enter and other contracts. Here we are not discussing of opportunity to enter other contracts. We are discussing of a concrete contract already existing in the legal patrimonial area of the creditor who cannot be fulfilled and performed by himself in this case. So uh, just to be, <laughs> no, I don't want to say, uh, but uh, to go out to just a second uh, of, the legal, of, the, of the legal discussion, this is not the waste of time um, uh, uh, that justify the paragraph 284, but is a concrete waste of money because of my of the performance to be done. Uh, uh, and this is uh, how I wish to close this uh, this section. In seeing, first of all, this uh, paragraph 284, not in contrast or indifference, but in evolution, and because of, of this element. So we can say that is a norm much more oriented toward the, uh, um, the world of the uh, business today, that there is uh, all the world of a normal obligation uh, today, but in which the so-called the future expenses are justified by uh, adding uh, a special regard in the concept of futility. The second section to which I wish to, and to which I, I go to the conclusion of my intervention is, um, uh, uh, is a, the structure, uh, uh, the structure, the operational structure that are the conditions of the recovery of the expenses. Um, uh, the theoretical explanation of the paragraph 284 may, uh, um, it is a, uh, you know, it, it, uh, as we uh, repeated yesterday, is uh, a reflex of the the basic principle of compensation in civil in civil court. Uh, so the uh, the equivalence between expenses and profit is no longer necessary to found liability. I'll tell you, it is unclear whether the previous approach will be continued by uh, the courts. Uh, the previous approach the before the entering enforce of this uh, of this norm. Um, the conditions of the right to claim damages in a state of performance must be met, of course, because uh, uh, the promise um, must have incurred the expenditure, the promisee, of course, and this must be demonstrated, the so-called the of Wendungen. Uh, uh, mm, and so this is the first uh, has been uh, uh, remarked also in English law, uh, the, uh, the, this is the first big difference or evolution, if you want, from the, from the original uh, conception of reliance. And thirdly, the expenses must be 
uh, uh, connected in some sense with the performance. Uh, this is a very clear, uh, <clears throat> this is a very important element to be cleared inside the conditions for recovery. Because the kind of expenses that we are asking to be refunded or indemnified are the kind of expenditures that only has a clear connection with the, the, uh, the frustrated performance. Uh, uh, this is a very important because we cannot uh, enlarge the range of the of the of the expenditure made on this uh, on this ground. And of course, this applied this uh, implied the obligations of the interpreter to a very strict connection that, as you can see, may entails not only economical, financial, uh, either they can they cannot be founded only upon the declaration of the of the creditor, but can uh, they have a, a, a objective? They must have an objective and solid ground, because this might be connected functionally to the promises that has not been performed, and so conceptually, objectively, and financially, and in the course of the business, of course, even if the connection may appear the most strange and the most rare. Let's say in this chain of production, we could say that the, the creator has a performer has a, a met some expenditures concerning something that um, very difficult uh, with much difficulty we can see as a connected to the performance, but the, the previous performance, but that are nevertheless part of the same chain of production in the factory, in assuming new position in. And of course, the most elementary is to enter in new contracts, to enter, so assuming new obligation towards uh, new final buyers. Uh, um, dispensers must have been reasonably incurred, so this is a, uh, what I just told, uh, described is what is called the uh, billing advisor uh, element, and uh, uh, this restriction is uh, of course uh, controversial because of the many possibility of interpretation through which we can found uh, reasonab uh, reasonableness in the expenses that have been uh, made by the creditor and what was the original performance he was waiting for. Uh, I will, um, so I wish to, to, to stop my intervention here because otherwise I will, I will go very far. And of course, opening the, the discussion upon my uh, upon my talk if some further explanation is needed thank you very much once again dear colleagues and thank you very much dear doctor Yeah, doctor, I can I can't hear you. Yeah, My, sorry. I, I was so boring that you mute <laughs> that you no. lost your voice. No, I was constantly here writing questions in chat box, lengthy questions, uh, summarizing something, whatever I could understand. Uh, but. Uh, uh, I think there, there are many colleagues of mine, uh, they are Indians and they, are, they think that, uh, so uh, I, I think I should ask my chair, uh, the Honorable Chair, Dr. Gupta, to please uh, moderate uh, for two minutes the discussion. Or Rajkumar Sandhu, please turn on your cameras. It will be a performing obligation. So please go ahead. <laughs> Otherwise, Professor Selveto will think that we are non performing. <laughs> Thanks, sir. Uh, your explanation is very. I see, I, I see a colleague. I, I see a colleague who is going to invoke the non performability of his obligation <laughs> because. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so please, Chandragupta, uh, do comment. 
वेरी वेरी गुड एक्सप्लेन ऑन ऑब्लिगेशन एंड अदर एरियाज और रियली वेल्यूबल एंड वेल नॉलेजेबल लेक्चर सर it was today your lecture was quite fast with speed you were delivering because a lot of there was you know outburst and sequences that you had to build up uh, it was quite tough also uh, today uh, in the previous lectures uh, as far as my uh, view point so anyway i summarize some thing in question so rajkumar could you just come in and say something if you have understood if you were there uh good afternoon ma'am uh, it was always an honor uh, good afternoon professor salvatro uh, it was always an honor to listen to you and uh, uh, to understand from you it, your each and every word is uh, ocean of knowledge for us and we are always uh, uh, obliged and humbled by your uh, explanation of concepts uh, but today i have to uh, admit that i was traveling so i could not uh, uh follow entire lecture i i heard uh, bits and pieces for uh, for the lecture but whatever i heard it was uh, really an honor for me uh, and uh, so so much in enriching that uh, uh, definitely i i will reflect uh, whatever i gained through your various discussions with my students i'll be sharing with my students and i'll be asking my students to write to you uh, if if they have any uh, Uh, any doubt or any uh, uh, any problem and uh, i hope that they will be able to uh, get benefit from your uh, knowledge uh, so a uh, few of my students uh, they were in your lecture at present i i don't know they are, they are here or not but earlier there were lot of my students were there they were attending your lecture and every day uh, they used to message me that when uh, professor salvatoro is uh, going to give lecture and uh, they are very keen and they are looking forward uh, for your lecture and in future also uh, we would like to invite you to your our university uh, which is in uh, northern part of india uh, state of jammu and kashmir you probably heard about it uh, it is always uh, uh, <laughs> in uh, in uh, news for various reasons and uh, and hopefully when this uh, restrictions are over uh, we'll be having face to face interaction probably in udaipur or in jammu or in other parts of india so uh, do inform us whenever you are visiting india or if uh, this uh, this uh, university ma'am jashri ma'am's university is uh, having some offline interaction uh, do inform me i would like to come to your university and have face to face interaction and uh, there's so much so much from uh, to learn from you so it is always an honor for our, uh, for us and i'm highly obliged for your interaction for your valuable comments uh, that's all from my side ma'am uh, over to you yes professor salvito do you have anything to your mic is mic so your mic okay can you hear me okay yes just just to thank you prof the colleague J professor ray because uh, is too kind toward me thank you very much i will be honored of course to come to to kashmir in hopefully in the more quiet time and uh, uh, of course we are here to establish mutual relationship because uh, i believe that we can have a very good um, patch together and we can have uh, many many opportunity for cooperation and uh, i was uh, would be a really honored to have this opportunity to cultivate them by many forms and uh, let's stay in touch of course we can uh, we can start i suppose uh, right now with there's a, trying to recap to recapitulate in a publication there's a seminars that thanks to the to professor singh we had the, the opportunity to to carry on so um, i'm uh, really honored of your acquaintance and i wish to say this uh, beside any formal academic logic um really real knowledge really i felt this is what i feel sincerely and uh, if i'm allowed i wish to to reply to them to the question that have been um, uh, have been uh, put it in the in the chat uh, I, I see them as being forgotten by professor yashri singh 
uh, the first one is uh, how and why non-performance of an individual or a firm or of a company is uh, at the target of a creditor's warning. Uh, why not the creditor's performance is uh, questionable as the investment or is a retrieval or investment is at loss due to his default of a vigilance and negligence. Uh, uh, so there's a true question. The first, the first is uh, the so-called uh, uh, warning, or um, uh, the, the so-called warning, is that um, uh, you know, in the course of business, uh, the the system try to economize the uh, also the remedy system. So it is a very important that uh, the conclusion may be the most positive that uh, that is expected that is in in absolute and conformity and compliance with the contractual provisions. So this is why the warning is the last advice at the Nachnung in which uh, through which the the debitor is uh, starting is uh, what is called the demora debitoris uh, is a put in delay. So according to this delay, after 30 years, he must, um, he must perform. After this uh, is, uh, um, of course, the question of uh, liability arises. Uh, please remember that we are not discussing only about breach of contract. We are discussing about breach of duty. And as I repeat, the duty to which we are referring this kind of remedies is no, has not only source in the contract, but also source in the obligation in itself. The obligation after a tort to pay for for a vehicle crash, let's say. So this uh, this non-performance is uh, subjected to the same rules. Um, uh, the second question: Why not the creditor's performance is a questionable? as the investment or is a retrieval of investment is uh, at loss due to its default of vigilance and negligence. Uh, creditor performance is, uh, um, maybe here is a uh, debtor performance, uh, is uh, at loss of, uh, due to its default of vigilance and negligence. Ah, okay, understood. No, the, the question seems, is very simple. Uh, it is not, uh, it is not unquestioned. The, quest the investment of creditor is questioned. Uh, it, it is questioned at the moment in which he has to justify what is a part of his um, uh, uh, demand for reimbursement for uh, indemnization. Uh, is questioned, and uh, as I just told, it has to be connected to the uh, rational to connect it with the performance that he has not received. Other way, uh, uh, other, uh, unless this kind of justification that cannot be paid and recover it. What we have to do is to differentiate in this question two positions. Uh, the position of the debtor or the creditor who is uh, asking for reimbursement is a position of the creditor who has to justify the future expenses he has incurred in because of the non-performant uh, uh, non uh, uh, obligation by his debt. Uh, the position of his default of a vigilance and negligence, it is uh, something that does not depend on him. I can, I can be vigilant and uh, uh, I'm of course liable for negligence upon my performance toward other. Uh, vigilance and negligence are, of course, vigilance are different position are two sources of personal obligations. Vigilance, for example, the uh, justification, the rationalization of the so-called uh, vicarious liability. And this is uh, another kind of, uh, uh, another arch of justification. Negligence, of course, is the, um, the basis for the fault in the, the, my performance. But in the case in which I must receive someone and I must, uh, my surveillance upon the my debtor performance may not always be of the same quality of the what I can do upon my own origin of a performance. Because uh, let's say the quality of the soil in the, in the case of Machnung, in the case of non compliance of the object of performance with what has been provided in the contract. And so, 
could uh, retrieve my position with respect to my creditor that are the one who will buy the shirt so I cannot produce the shirt well this kind of a failure can be detected only at the moment in which the shipment has been done so this is a you know a past act uh, failure while the anti-act failure maybe mm, that is the full non-performance never my debtor shipped to me the mm, the soil let's say well in these cases the um, my, many probably my investment my few my expenses that can be frustrated by non-performance by the failure in performing started before because i started buying new machinery new machines new production starting with new contracts before i signed the contract and thanks to this i have this kind of connection time may be an element for discussing the coherence between the concept of um, future expenses and the non-performance of the debtor in the moment of recovering damages but time is not the only criterion through which we can discuss the, the performability of this kind of uh, recovery uh, the last question is uh, the legal logic and performance are concurrent to normative and patrimoniality aren't they as they are major influences to decide performance in contracts and to manipulate the procedures of non-performance uh, mm. okay uh, 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 legal logic uh, uh, legal logic of course has its own logic uh, so um, um, the, the, of, of course legal logic is uh, a, a special one because uh, uh, of course it has a normativity and uh, it is not only something that belongs to like the other forms of logic to the to the uh, a branch of logic no it normative one we could say that legal logic uh, serve the normative system and normative is uh, something that is going to go to to set duties and to set uh, obligations and to, of course to set rights uh, in this sense why uh, the the performance uh, is a, um, uh, until it is uh, freely accepted by the party has to be of course analyzed and evaluated at the, at the light of legal logic and uh, of course the whatever it happens in matter of uh, the rest of the chain is uh, something that belongs to the subject uh, we of course assume that our creditor um, our creditor in the, the example i put uh, just put is a subject who has a, a, a business relationship with his, his creditor with the final buyers of the shirt but we could say that the creditor may be a, a donor of the shirts so we can have uh, uh, to the poorer people so he expected the soil to be of a certain quantity quality and uh, to be uh, the cheaper in time because he needed this to in order to perform is uh, something that is go beyond any kind of patrimoniality and the go out of uh, any form of uh, um, of uh, uh, you know chain of uh, the, the capitalistic market today uh, mm -hmm what we do what we never must uh, confuse is the capitalism as a mean and the capitalism as an end because uh, through the, the the sources of a legal logic and the patrimoniality we can arrive to some kind of a performance that uh, whom uh, final justification maybe meta legal justification are not inside the legal system or capitalistic system of course let's say i can uh, i can i can justify i can justify all in term of a uh, geld in german in, of money of cash what is performance and non performance i can justify only through the contract what is uh, uh, the obligation performed or not performed not properly performed but what is the result 
of the, in the concrete world of the subjects is uh, something, something that is open to their, their own choice. We discuss about means, not about mm -hmm. final ends. This happened to always to be in the hands of God or in the hands of the subjects. Thank you very Thank much you. for, for your you, questions. Clarifying uh, very uh, intricate uh, uh, complexities in the terms or the concepts that create confusion uh, in an ordinary sense also. But if you take it into from legal point of view, uh, they are really uh, for you a very heavy burden to solve if a client or a customer goes through such kind of crisis uh, publicly. Uh, and because uh, in private sphere, mostly uh, the things are into in a personal context. But when those personal contexts become political or public, then these normative patrimoniality and et cetera, et cetera, they create a kind of, you know, big confusion and nexus for the legal lawyers to find out evidences, how to sort out. And even in financial terms, economic terms, if chartered accountancy is dealing with such kind of, you know, uh, creditor and debitors performance, then also they have to find out certain sort of you know uh, line that can solve or resolve or then go it going to the court finally so it's a very yeah. complicated thing i think the best uh, uh, you, the base of the whole thought law is i think the breach of duty and breach of contract that is if it had been the first lecture then the other sequences could have gone in a better way yeah, 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 Professor. I subscribe your point of view. What I would I retain? What I believe that in this case, in these cases, like in many others, uh, please uh, remember that when we discuss about the patrimoniality, we are not discussing about, of course, uh, um, rich people. We are discussing about how to convert some kind because otherwise we cannot discuss about anything. Let's say we, uh, what we do when we discuss um, and we, we, um, we, we said several times, that's true days, that uh, uh, we discuss uh, the, the new frontier of love towards is uh, the uncommensurability of certain goods. So uh, the new frontiers of uh, love towards, it is no more to convert according to my opinion, is no more to convert damages into cash, damages into money. Because we realize with the evolution, with the culture evolution, that there are many, many goods. We already know, but today is more stringent, this, that there are many goods that are not only irreplaceable, so cannot be uh, substituted by other goods, but they are only part of a common generality of interest, toward which we can uh, cannot have an excessive notion, even in legal logic or in common logic. Uh, it is very hard to, to say how do we protect, let's say, the environment in itself or the visage in itself. Um, you know, it is something that belongs to philosophical uh, that I, I agree hegemonic. on. Yes. Hegemonic, are, ontolo hegemonic ontological source is there with regard to some kind of establishing base for legal logic. This is, this is what I say. Uh, I, I believe that the, prog the progress of this uh, line that you focus it, uh, it to, con uh, to convert into patrimoniality, whatever, is going to have a uh, stop, a very clear stop to some uh, common and very uh, basic element. Uh, environment is one of these. Uh, uh, and uh, a jurist must conform to this, to this kind of trend. I believe that, that a jurist that does not participate to the you know the building of the of uh, the current thought upon the uh, all these problems is like you know a medicine man who see the covid the coronavirus coronavirus and uh, doesn't participate to his uh, to his study to its study 
So uh, uh, we saw this in the in the in the current reflection. We saw that there are many goods that are we, I, like we told in this day that are uh, incommensurable. We cannot commensurate. And we see as I reflect that the the law of thoughts is uh, absorbing, is assuming many tools that can try to uh, to give an answer to this concept. You know, uh, the preemption. I told you, the how we can we work in dangerous activity in preemption. Well, this is another reflex, but this is a reflex in the in in what sense? Uh, in a more individual sense in which a subject is prevented to do what he wants to do because of the non-performance of his debtor. And as I repeat, what is a, uh, toward the activity of the, of the creditor in our example is on his own hands. Patrimoniality in itself is not a problem, uh, you know, uh, because it's a medium. Uh, patrimoniality as an end can be a problem. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Professor. Thank you to everyone. Any, uh, uh, there are some students we can see they are all attending, listening to you, but they are not turning on their cameras. Um, every time they leave me alone to question, sir. <laughs> so sorry. Sir, actually, you know, they are going to listen and re-listen to your lecture. There's one boy, he is finally, yesterday he was there. So, Jayendar, do you have anything to say to sir? Please. Any short statement for sir? Jayendar, can you listen? Your mic is off. Who is he? Gender uh, is gone. Right, sir? The tiger, the tiger is back. <laughs> He's learning to be a tiger. He's learning how to be a tiger. So they are you know, passive listeners. <laughs> Thank you, sir. Good night. Sorry, good good day to you. Have a fine day. Thank, no, you. Mike is Thank, again you very, Thank you very much, everybody. Have a good night. Thanks for your very, very kind attention. See you tomorrow. Bye. Thank you, sir. Bye, Bye. sir. Bye. Bye. Bye.